All right, good to see you guys tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about critical race theory, and I just want to start with a news article that maybe you saw. That I saw this yesterday, and um, here's the headline. This is from Fox News, but you can find it all over the place. And this is the title. Oxford music professors deem sheet music colonialist. Say, say curriculum needs to be deco decolonized. Sheet music is racist. You know what sheet music is, right? Sheet music is the music that's printed on a piece of paper as opposed to window shade music, as I've heard it called, on the screen, right? Uh, she, so I want to read you some of this article. It says, staff members within the University of Oxford's music department have deemed sheet music uh, colonialist, which is a derogatory term, and have suggested ways to decolonize the curriculum. Professor said that music notation has not shaken off its connection to its colonial past and that not rebranding it would be a slap in the face for students of color, according to documents reviewed by the British outlet The Telegraph. The, um, the same faculty also reportedly questioned whether the current curriculum was complicit in white supremacy, pointing to the program's focus on white European music from the slave period, composers like Mozart and Beethoven. The professors further suggested that certain classical music skills like playing the piano and conducting orchestral arrangements ought not to be required because they structurally center white European music and cause students of color great distress. The faculty members said the curriculum should broaden its offerings with studies like African and African diasporic musics, global musics, and popular musics. Oxford's music curriculum already offers non-Eurocentric course options, but professors who propose these changes said the school's nearly all-white faculty gives privilege to white musicians by default. The proposed changes appear to have driven in response uh, to the Black Lives Matter movement. Arising from the international Black Lives Matter demonstrations, the faculty board proposed making changes to enhance the diversity of the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and then it goes on a few other things. But you, you get the idea of what's going on. And by the way, this is not Babylon B. If I would have read that, I would have thought Babylon B. Babylon B is a satire website, right? This is real news. You can find it all over the place. Why do I read that to you? It's because it is the epitome of critical race theory. Okay? If you don't know what critical race theory is, and if this is at all a new term for you, that is what I just read. Everything in life must be viewed according to racism. Everything is racist. Everything is white supremacy. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. But we're going to talk about where it came from and ultimately how it affects churches because like I said in here before, um, this is something the Southern Baptist Convention is buying into at the top levels. And so that's why we need to understand it as, uh, you know, from biblical point of view. And so, um, uh, we're going to talk about critical race theory. Is it an anal analytical tool or mass deceit? And the reason I put this title on here, because I mentioned SBC two years ago in the national convention, uh, the convention voted on Proposition 9. And Proposition 9 was about critical race theory. And most people probably didn't know what it meant, but the idea of this proposition which passed was it, it was against critical race theory to a degree but it said that it is a useful analytical tool. Okay, so there's a huge hubbub about this thing. And it's a major issue in the Southern Baptist Convention right now, that and a few other things that are very concerning. Uh, but the, the guy who is really pushing this thing, who's one of the vice presidents or something of the, of the convention, uh, he called an analytical tool. Well, is critical race theory an analytical tool or is it not? So that's why we're talking about this. Where did it come from? Um, well, you know, I know where it came from. We can, we're going to study that a little bit. How does it look in our society? Over this last year, we saw it. In the last two, three years especially, this is really coming to the top, right? Um, things like Colin Kaepernick in the NFL. Uh, his kneeling, which has started off that whole mess of, you know, we, we don't stand anymore for, you know, the national anthem. We kneel in solidarity and all this kinds of stuff. Uh, he's protesting brutality toward black people, or the technical term is people of color. That's the term you're supposed to use now. It means non-white. It's, it's any color, you know, Asian or Indian or whatever, black. Uh, and then we have the whole defund the police movement. And you hear about the defund the police movement, the whole uh, fiasco out in Seattle this past year, along with all the riots that we had all around the country. It all comes from critical race theory. Everything is about racism and white supremacy. The idea of reparations uh, comes from critical race theory. 
uh, and there's a city up in outside of Chicago, I think now, isn't it? Well, they voted in, they're going to give reparations to uh, people of color. And the 1619 Project, anyone familiar with the 1619 Project? We're going to talk about that a little bit as we go as we go through this here too. This is something that's being bought into by schools uh, about changing the history of America. Uh, and so all these kind of things. We have all these police shootings, you know, that we hear about all the time. Uh, the Breonna Taylor incident, she was shot in her apartment. Uh, the police got the wrong door. That's the story how it went. Entered the wrong place and, and she ended up getting killed. The George Floyd thing, everybody knows about George Floyd, right? Because it's on the news now with the, um, the, the trial for Derek Chauvin or Chauvin, however you say his name, uh, and to find out what's going on there. Uh, that was back last Memorial Day killed in police custody, and this is not necessarily looked at as a police murder, or, uh, I mean, there's so many ways you can look at this, right? Was he guilty? Was he not? Was he a little holy, you know, holy boy poster child or not? You know, you got all that stuff going on, uh, but it doesn't, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is the officer was white and he was color, of color. He was black, uh, and so that's the only thing that matters there, so it's a racial thing. Uh, Rayshard Brooks, he was a guy at that Wendy's, you know, um, he uh, uh, shot, uh, one of the, an officer shot him, right? They had the whole taser incident and everything. Uh, Walter Wallace, he refused to drop his knife, his knife, uh, officer shot him. So it just goes on and on, right? And everything is looked at in the view of racism. Now, the reason I took the last two weeks and talked about what God thinks of racism is because when we go through this, it will sound overtly racist but it's not, okay? I, I just want to be very, very clear what the Bible says about this idea of racism, which is what I believe about racism. So just, just stating facts sounds racist, but I'm just trying to give it to you simply as it is. Um, I read these two books here in preparations for this. These are books, uh, I'd read them in the restaurant, you know, and i turn them upside down when, when I wasn't there, you know, so nobody would really see what I was reading. What are you reading? Um, because they might wonder where I was at. This one's called Critical Race Theory. If you're interested, all these are like the two Gospels, um, the more easy to read Gospels of this. Critical Race Theory by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefan, I can always say that name. Uh, critical race theory, and then this one, white fragility. This one you hear about a lot. Uh, Robin D'Angelo, uh, she's white, and she, you know, she's become woke. She's understood her white supremacy and her racism just because she's white. And so, white fragility. These are these. If you're interested in this, you want to take it further. Those are two great books to read. Uh, but you got to read them, understanding this is these are not Christian books talking about it. These are their books trying to convince you to think their way. So if you're not real strong in this, I wouldn't read them yet, right? Until you're trying to study, you know, and you're, you, you got to study the other side, right? We, we can listen to like what I'm saying. We can watch YouTube videos. We can read books on this. But if you really want to understand what they say, you have to read their stuff, which is what I did in preparation for this. So um, we have this question. What is the fundamental problem of society and how do we fix it? This is really what we're getting at here. What is the fundamental problem of society and how do we fix it? Most of us would probably say, well, let me ask you, if you, if I were to come and ask you the question, what is the fundamental problem? First of all, are we all agreed that there's a problem with society? Can, can we at least agree on that? There's problems, right? If I were to ask you, what is the fundamental problem of society? What would you say? They need Jesus. Sin, they need Jesus. Okay. Sin. Break down the family. Ultimately, it comes back to the wickedness of men's hearts, which is sin, which causes the breakdown in family. Uh, so it comes down to wickedness. That's our problem. What is the solution to that problem? God. God. The gospel. Right? So the problem with society is man is wicked. It's sin. The, the way to fix it is the gospel. God changing the hearts of man. Okay. That's how we're going to answer the question biblically. That's what we know. When you look at things in terms of critical race theory, the fundamental problem of society is not sin, and it's not the wickedness of men's hearts. The fundamental problem of society is what? Racism. Okay? You see how we're starting off with a totally different foundation here. That's why this is not an analytical tool. It's a worldview. Um, so the fundamental problem of society is racism. How do you fix racism? How do you fix the fundamental problem of society? You cause the racists to be oppressed and who were formerly oppressed people are elevated. 
That's how you fix society. That's how you get to the utopia. Okay. So can you see before we even really get into this, how this is a worldview that is absolutely antithetical, did I say that right, to the Christian worldview? They don't mix. They, they're not compatible. C cr uh, critical race theory is not compatible with a biblical worldview at all. That's why we have to stand against this. That's why churches that are buying into this and the convention that's starting to buy into this, they're not starting to, I think there are ways into it, we have to stand against this stuff because it's flat out wrong and it's absolutely unbiblical. And that's why we're going through this, okay? Uh, so if the fundamental problem with society is race, racism, we need a tool to fix racism. If the fundamental problem with society is sin, we need something that can fix sin, which is the gospel. So we need to find the right tool. So uh, last summer, I took on this job that I never recommend anybody to take on. Uh, we have the old van, right? Does, everybody, does anybody have an old van? You know, the old car, the one the kids drive, right? So we have that old blue van that uh, has been a thorn in my side since we got it. And it's always leaking something, always falling apart. So uh, it started just leaking power steering fluid like crazy, and I found out that it was a steering rack. Now, to have a steering rack replaced, it would have cost more than that van is worth. So I'm brilliant. I'm like, I'm going to do this myself. Okay? Yeah, I do these kind of things. Not always really smart, but I did. And I did get it done. As a matter of fact, I laid under so much, and so much grease and oil and um, power steering fluid under that car. My clothes were nasty. I, I brought them in here. Last year we had the... The, um, the teens had their camp here at the church, and I was doing some lessons for them, and I brought them in as an object lesson. I mean, they were just nasty. I just had to throw them out, right? But I'm laying in the car, and if you've ever replaced a steering rack, you know that it's impossible. A steering rack is that thing that runs between the wheels, and you know, and it turns aside, springs a leak, and you have a mess, and you can't, and you lose your steering. And so I'm up there, and I realize, well, part of the problem with this van is that everything is rusted out. You go take a bolt off, and it breaks. That was a lot of fun, let me tell you, right there. But there's there's a couple of bolts up in the top of this thing, and I'm laying under the car, and this thing is heavy, and there's bolts that like are inaccessible because your wrench is too thick. And so I, ha I have a whole bunch of tools, but nothing that would work for the job. So I had to get online, I had to order a thinner wrench. And that was it, you know, just, just, I could just barely get it up there and take this thing off. So there went many, many hours of my time. But I tell you this story, um, you know, and I, and I use some, you ever use some Christian lingo, Christian cuss? I mean, not bad. I mean, like, stu <laughs> stupid idiots. I think I use that term a lot. They never designed this thing. Stupid idiots, right? How come they don't make this stuff where you can actually get to it? So this was really irritating to me. But, I learned something. Maybe I didn't learn it, but I realized it more. You have to have the right tool for the job, right? I have a toolbox. Years and years ago, I bought all craftsman hand tools because Sears will never go out of business, and I'll always, you know, that's how it was. And so I bought all these hand tools, and um, but nothing would work, right? I had all these tools and nothing that would fix because this was a particular problem. I needed a specific tool for it. The same thing we have with society. We have a problem in society, and we need the right tool to fix the problem, okay? And the right tool is not critical race theory, because critical race theory treats a problem that is not the real problem. And I hope by the time we get to the end of this that you guys will understand, if you don't already, exactly why that's the problem. So find the right tool for the job. That's what we're going to try to do. All right. Let me show you this. And now... I don't know about you guys, to me, this just excites me. When I start seeing what we have going on and where it came from, some of you will be like, oh, this is boring, you know, I'm not into all that. I find this interesting, I hope you will too, because this is the background to where we are. Let's just start at the bottom here. This is what we see around us, okay? We see the Black Lives Matter movement, which the question, we hear it a thousand times, right? Do Black Lives Matter? Of course they do. That's what we spent the last two weeks talking about. We're all equal, right? There aren't really races. They're just different colors of skin, different melatonin, right? Uh, melatonin. Mel how do, how, did I say that right? Mel melatonin? Well, that stuff that makes it color. Melatonin. Is that right? It didn't sound right when I said it. A black Lives Matter. Reparations. Affirmative action. That's been going around a while. Police brutality, or at least claims of police brutality. 
the 1619 project. How about other things I don't have on there like riots? Um, whatever, the list goes on. Pretty much everything in society we hear about racism. Sheet music, let's put sheet music up there, right? Sheet music is racist. All these things, where does it all come from? Well, it comes from critical race theory. Where does critical race theory come from? It comes from its daddy, critical theory, which comes from its daddy, Marxism. Okay, so if you don't know anything about Marxism, we're gonna start there today and start to understand how we get all the way to down here. And this is totally corrupting our society. It's really messing up our society. So all the stuff we see in the news, it's daddy, granddaddy, great granddaddy is Karl Marx, okay? So that's where we're gonna stop, Karl Marx. There he is. Well, that's actually just a picture of him. It's not really him, in case you're wondering. All right, Karl Marx and Marxism. Now, any like history buffs that really this is like really gets you going. You love this kind of stuff. You could go forever on Karl Marx. Anybody? What was that? I had several classes in college. Okay. Yeah. So you, you probably even could go into more depth if you wanted to. I'm just going to give a, a kind of a quick recap of who Karl Marx was and what he taught. He was a German philosopher. Lived in the 1800s. Uh, became interested in class relations social classes, you know, how they relate to each other and why everybody doesn't get along. What is the problem in society? Remember, we talked about the problem in society is sin, it's the weakness of man. Karl Marx, not being a believer, obviously is not going to find sin as the problem. He found class warfare to be the problem. You had the social class, uh, the social class, you had the like lower class, middle class, upper class, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he saw it said, these social classes are constantly in conflict. And this is how he defined them. And, and the oppressor and oppressed. Now for him, it was economic. You know, the upper class and the middle class, the lower class. It was economics, how much wealth that you have. And the oppressor group he called the bourgeoisie, French word, okay? The, these were the, the, technically the middle class. And then the oppressed were the proletariat, which were the working class. So basically what you have going on is the proletariat were going out and working, minimum wage kind of a thing, making money for the bourgeoisie, who were then getting rich off the backs of the proletariat, which caused some issues there between them in Karl Marx's idea. So Karl Marx says, wait a minute here, this is causing conflict, so what we need to do to fix this problem is we need to take the proletariat and raise them up and equalize things better. But he said a lot of times people don't understand what's going on here. And the only way to fix the problems in society is for the proletariat, the oppressed people, the lower class, to realize what's going on and then fight against the oppressor class. And then eventually they become the oppressors and now they're the oppressed. Now they have to fight against them. So you're gonna, he, his idea was basically this is going to be going on all the time as the social classes change up and down and, and everything like that. But this, this is an economic thing for Karl Marx, which obviously he didn't believe in capitalism because this is capitalism to a degree. I, I, I wouldn't use oppressor and oppressed. That was his term. But it, it's, you, you got to get rid of capitalism because capitalism means someone can go out and they can work and they can make money, and yeah, there's going to be there's different classes. Oftentimes, it's based on how hard you want to work. Not always, but sometimes it is. Um, but he didn't like that, okay? He said the way to fix the problems in society is you have to try to equalize the these classes. So capitalism is obviously equal. The problem in society is a struggle between these different economic classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So eventually he real, he believed that in time the oppressed would realize that they're oppressed, they'll, they'll, they'll try to flip it and then go on. So Marx died. Okay, that's Marxism basically. Economic, social class, uh, problems, you gotta equalize things better. Marx died and his followers continued on. And in 1923, a group of his followers founded what is called the Frankfurt School in, uh, Germany. It was, or actually, well, it's called the Institute for Social Research, but it's known as the Frankfurt School. And his followers got together and he took Marxist ideas and they began to develop what is called critical theory, which is critiquing society to find out how to fix these problems in society. Okay, so now you can see we're adding the word critical into this whole thing. Um, 
the, the school was shut down when Hitler came to power and they actually relocated to Columbia University here in the United States and then later on uh, went back to Germany uh, later. So here we are. We talked about Marx, Karl Marx. Now his followers are getting together using his ideas, oppressed and oppressor, or oppressor and oppressed economically, and they're coming up with critical theory at the Frankfurt School saying we need to critique society to fix these problems. For Karl Marx, it was economic, but it could be any number of things. The idea is the oppressors are always oppressing the oppressed people, and that needs to stop. Um, now, we have to understand that this doesn't necessarily mean that the um, oppressors are like oppressing them and like cracking a whip over them. Like we think of the slave owners and the slaves. Obviously, there's oppression there. Or, um, you know, so some mean person, some mean boss oppressing their mean workers. It didn't have to be a, a, a connection like that. It really had to be more of an influence thing. And let me show you this. This is how they viewed it, okay? The oppressor is oppressing the oppressed through what is called hegemonic power. Hegemonic power is not I'm cracking a whip over you or I'm telling you what to do. It's that my influence and my culture is something that you're forced to live under. It doesn't, I can, I can oppress you without even knowing who you are. You don't have to know who I am. It's just that we have this culture that oppresses you. Now, if we can just fast forward to where we are today, in this worldview, the culture we live in is oppressed by white, male, straight, Christian, healthy men, well, male and men, those kind of go together, right? And so this is a white, male, straight Christian society. So therefore, if you don't fit into that group, you're the oppressed and you need to overthrow the wicked oppressors, which are people like me, okay? So, so that, that's kind of how this works in our society once you follow this all the way to the end. That, by the way, is part of critical race theory. Okay, so we have the uh, oppressor and oppressed. Hegemonic power is just that you live in a society. Because you're a woman, you live in a male-dominated society, men are your oppressors. Boy, doesn't that work good in the marriage when you start looking at every man as your oppressor, right? Doesn't that work good in the workplace? You can kind of start to see now how, why our society is the way that it is because everything is looked at as I'm oppressed, I'm a victim. You're hurting me. It's just society that we live in. So. Makes sense so far. Do I, am I going too fast? Do we need clarification? Okay. You so said I thought this was a Bible study, not history. We've got to work up to how this affects us today. Okay. So critical theory, it critiques society to make changes that allow the oppressed to overcome their uh, oppression. So I think now we're to the point where you have something in the outline. Critical theory, we're just going through and we're looking at these. Critical theory critiques society to make changes that allow the oppressed to overcome their oppression. For Karl Marx, it was economic. The poor people need to overcome the rich people. That's what he wanted. It could be whatever it happens to be. Okay, the, today it's race. It could be male, female. You know, the, that's what the feminist movement is all about. The feminists need to rise up and overthrow the male domination in society. Or whatever it happens to be, LGBTQ versus straight, right? We, we are a, a heterosexual dominated society. That's hegemonic power because that's just what's accepted. So the LGBT people need to rise up and overthrow that. That's where all this comes from. It's all critical theory, okay? Totally anti-biblical, uh, but that's, that's the world we're living in. So um, we have oppressor and oppressed. What makes a person a member of an oppressed group or an oppressor group. Any number of things, actually. Gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, all that is what HR5 is about, religion, your economic status, whatever, okay? And these are group things. This is another problem with this whole thing is it's groups, it's not people. It's not like, oh, this, this person is rich, you know, that's a bad rich person, it's a bad person. No, they're bad because they're rich. If you're in the rich group, you're just a bad person. If you're in the white, straight, male group, you're bad because you're in... It doesn't matter what you have done. 
uh, when it comes to the critical race theory and race, just because you're a white person, you are racist because you're in that group. And what you do is totally irrelevant. It's what group you're in, okay? We see the in the Bible, there's individual things. Salvation is individual. The gospel is individual. You have to choose it yourself. This is all about groups, okay? And you can't get out of your group. You're stuck in your group. So if you're white, uh, if you're a white person, you're in the white group. And I'm sorry, but you're racist. You say, oh, my friends are, are Asians and black and Hispanics. I don't care. You're racist because you're white. Okay, it's a definition thing. We have to understand this. And, and I'm not building up a straw man here. I'm just simply telling you, I mean, I read the books. That's what it is. It's very clear. Um, so we're just going to define some things here. We're going to look at some definitions that we need to understand as we go into this. The first one is, the, is privilege. What does privilege mean? It means the advantages of the oppressor group unavailable to the oppressed group. The advantages of the oppressor group unavailable to the oppressed group. Okay, um, it might be something as simple as a left-handed person living in a right-handed world. My wife knows about that. She she always complained those those deaths in school. The, the you know the little arm thing was always on the wrong side. You know, uh, left-handed. You know, things are made for right-handed people. We call it right for a reason because right means correct. <laughs> So, but it could be something like that, or it could, could be because of the color of your skin, you don't feel safe walking down the road. You know, have you seen people on TV saying, just because of the color I am, I don't feel safe on society, someone's going to shoot me. Well, that's justified or not, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, if you're talking about critical race theory, the oppressor group, that's white people, have the privilege of being able to walk down the street without being shot by police for no reason. Whereas if you're a person of color, black or Hispanic or Asian or whatever, you walk out the door, you're afraid you're going to be shot by a cop for no reason. Okay, that's the thinking behind critical race theory. Um, and so privileges unavailable to the oppressed group. That's what the term privilege means when you hear that. So white privilege, that's a big term you hear all the time. There's things that white people get that people of color do not get, such as job interviews, um, safety, police protection, all these. Now, I'm not saying that's how it is. I'm saying that's how it's viewed, okay, under, under, this, this, under this thinking. Another term, you might hear this, you might not, um, intersectionality. Have you heard that term before? You, you, some of you might know exactly what we're talking about here. Intersectionality. Um, it has nothing to do with roundabouts. Those are like the worst intersections they've made ever. We about got hit on Sunday morning coming to church and they went by the hospital because they designed that thing terribly. People coming from the West hardly ever stopped coming in there. We about got it several times there. So, but that's my little, little, little pet peeve I have is roundabouts. I can't stand those things. But um, intersectionality, what is intersectionality? The concept of understanding a person's advantages and disadvantages based on how many contributing factors of oppression he or she has. Okay, brings us down a little bit. In other words, we talked about the oppressor groups and the oppressed groups, right? What makes a person oppressed? Well, any number of things. And how many of those things you have going against you is that's called intersections. How many intersections are against you? That's how bad you have it. For example, like I mentioned, um, oh, actually, let me just show you this graphic I made here. Okay, uh, back to our, these are oppressed, these are, I mean, oppressors and oppressed. These are some examples I pulled out. This is the most oppressor group. These are, this is like the worst kind of person you could be because you have the most privileges in our society, according to this thought, okay? If you're white, if you're heterosexual, if you're Christian, you're healthy, and you're male. I mean, that's me, right? That's me. You have all the privileges in society. This is hegemonic power. It doesn't mean that I have done something to oppress a woman or a black or a lesbian. It means that I'm in that group. So I'm bad, okay? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, if you're that. Now, anything that you have that is not one of those... And this, these are not well-defined. It, it's For everybody, it's a different thing, but this is generally understood. Anything that you have that's against one of those is an intersection of oppression. 
Like say all these are true except you're, you're black. Now that's one intersection. So um, you can call yourself oppressed by someone who is the same except they're white. Now if the only thing, maybe you're a, a gay person. So now that's one point of intersection against you. Let's just say you're an Asian lesbian person. Female, obviously, if you're, let's, so that's three points of intersection. So there's kind of this pecking order, you see, and the more intersections you have against you, the more you should be overthrowing the oppressors. The more rights you should have, the more government should be standing up for you. Okay? You, you, you see what I'm talking about here? And this is, this is not a biblical way of looking at the world, but this is critical theory and when, when it's all about this and this, it becomes critical race theory, okay? That's why this is not a biblical thing. It's not a godly thing. It's a worldview. It's not a tool for analyzing society, all right? So some of our convention people need to understand this, uh, but they don't. This has been a really big thing. So this is, this is intersectionality. How many things against this you are? So if you're in here and you're all these things, but you're a woman, Okay, and this probably fits most, maybe all of us in the room, uh, we're either male or female. Okay, um, maybe some of you have some other, you know, nationalities or whatever. But let's just say we were all white, heterosexual, Christian, healthy, male or female. Okay, that means that half of us in here are oppressing the females. You say, well, I've never oppressed a female. It doesn't matter. You're in the group. Okay. You must be overthrown. You're a bad man because you're in that group. This is the thought process behind critical theory. Criticizing, being critical, and that is not necessarily a bad word. You know, in philosophy, critical doesn't mean a bad thing. It means you're really critiquing something, okay? You're, you're, you're critiquing society. You find out how do we fix the problem? And you fix the problem by overthrowing these people and elevating these people. And the more of these other points you have, the higher you should go. The more reparations, maybe, you know, the more um, uh, court cases you should win, whatever. So the more, the more of these, you know, non-these categories you have, the more you are down here, the more points of intersection you have. Now, here's an illustration. I made a video about this several months ago. When we were going through the whole um, confirmation promise uh, uh, process for Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court, right? I was watching this, and something really hit me as I was watching this, and they finally confirmed her to the Supreme Court. Uh, as far as I can tell, excellent choice. You know, we haven't seen enough of her decisions yet to know, but, you know, everybody remembers that blank pad. <laughs> she just had all this stuff in her head, and she was, just, she was giving what I thought were great answers. After she was confirmed, the Girl Scouts of America posted this, um, this meme with her and the other four women Supreme Court justices that have been confirmed their position, and they, and they congratulated her for being the fifth woman to be on the Supreme Court. And so they had this meme, and it was cool. Everybody was applauding. Well, they received severe backlash. The Girl Scouts received backlash against her. Now, they should be applauding this, right? Because she's a woman, and she's taking a spot that historically went to men. So she should have been applauded for breaking into the oppressed group or the oppressor group, right? A woman has taken his job that a man always has. She should be applauded, but she wasn't. You know why? Christian. Well, I don't know if she was Catholic maybe, right? But we, we could take that term out of there and we could just put, um, well, not with the non, and we could put conservative, right? In that case, conservative Trump the fact that she was a woman. So she had a point of intersection, whereas she was a female. But politically, if you're conservative, sorry, that's more important, right? You have to buy into our ideology. You must buy into our ideology. So she's a bad person. Instead of being all excited that she was a woman, no, she didn't think their way. So she needs to stay lower again. It's not a good thing that she was put on the Supreme Court. Um, here's another term, standpoint epistemology. You say, wow, what does that mean? Okay, the definition, and I'll explain it. Only the oppressed can clearly understand the structures that cause their oppression. 
Okay, let's look at the word here first, standpoint epistemology. The word standpoint is there because it's your standpoint, it's how you view things, or it's where you stand, right? Now, from my standpoint, I see it this way. We use it that way. Epistemology is the study of, of what we know. So if somebody, you know, if they delve into epistemology, they're studying the things that we know. How do we know things? That kind of thing, okay? And so this term, it's also called standpoint theory, if you want a little bit shorter term. Basically, it's the idea that you cannot understand what the oppressed people experience unless you are an oppressed person. In other words, I, I'm a white male. That's fairly obvious, I think, right? Now, I guess I could say I'm a white female, and that'd be fine. We're the lunatics that we have in our government today. Okay, I, I'm a white female. Boom, now I am. But, um, oh, whatever color I want. I mean, this, it's just, it's absolutely crazy. So, because I'm a white male, there is no way that I can understand what a white female goes through. It's impossible. I cannot understand uh, women's political issues. Much more, I cannot understand a black woman's issues that she's going through. I, I can't because I'm a white male. I'm totally blinded to other things. I can only see things through my point of view. So um, look at this sign. Maybe you've seen something like this. No uterus, no, no opinion. What's that about? <laughs> abortion? Here's the point. I cannot have a view on abortion because I'm not a woman. That's what that sign means. Okay? You understand? That's standpoint epistemology or standpoint theory. The only person that can have a view on abortion is a woman. Okay? Now, if I had, if I was a gynecologist, if I had studied prenatal care and I had a doctor's degree in that, I'm a man. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter at all. The only way I can have a view on abortion is if I'm a woman. And to take it to another degree, I have to be a woman who believes that abortion is okay. Because if not, I have bought into, I have eternalized male domination. That's how this stuff works. You see, it all comes down to you have to see things the way that we see them. Um, so there we go. That's, uh, <laughs> that's how it is. So I can't have an opinion on that, right? I, I could go and I could march at abortion rally. Well, what do I know? I'm a man. I could never have a baby anyway. Well, there's some men fighting for the fact that they need to be able to be pregnant too. I mean, really? But as a white yeah. male, can you support them? Oh, I, yeah, if I see it their way, I can support them. No, no, if, if my opinion doesn't agree with them, it doesn't count. Yeah. But however, if you're out, Yeah, well, that's the same thing. Yeah, the same thing Amy Courtney Barrett was going through. She's a woman. Yeah, that's great. Oh, but she doesn't agree with us. So, you know, she's going to be ostracized. I mean, I. I, I I struggle this because I know it, it could sound like I'm coming at this from a Baptist worldview, right? And But I'm telling you what they actually believe. Read the books. This is what they believe. Um, it's, uh, I just want to be careful what I say. So, um, all right, I think that is where we're going to end it for now. Uh, we didn't get to the back side. Basically, we talked today about Marxism, what it is, oppressor versus oppressed, economically for him, which then brought critical theory. Critical theory is basically that we need to critique society to attack the problems in society. Now, next week, what we'll plan to do is we'll talk about how that specifically looks in the critical race theory, okay? Critical theory could be oppressor versus oppressed and, you know, gender issues, uh, economics, um, you know, the LGBTQ movement, whatever. It's more of a broad category. And then we just add race in there. It's all about race. It's all about the color of your skin, okay, which is the stuff that we're seeing today. When we go to critical theory and we start looking at other people as oppressor and oppressed, what does this do for the unity in the body of Christ? I mean, it's gone, right? This is not biblical worldview. We have to stay away from that, which is why when we get into critical race theory next week, we see it because Marxism is unbiblical, because critical theory is unbiblical, critical race theory is also unbiblical because it's just 
this narrow down to dealing with race. So we need to understand this. One more to your bottom box, the Great Reset. The Great Reset. Yeah, there's nobody seems to know exactly what it is, but it's pretty much upending society. Yeah. Yeah. 